Well, happy Easter. And uh, just, I'm just thrilled. I just want to say I'm thrilled to be with you this morning. I'm thrilled that you are here at St. John worshiping the risen Christ together with us. And it's just a wonderful thing. Isn't it? It's a wonderful blessing. Now, my sermon this morning is titled, I Am the Resurrection and the Life. And I don't want you to get the wrong idea. I don't want to get off on the wrong uh, foot here. I just want to make sure everyone's clear that I'm not saying that I am the resurrection and the life. Okay? That, that's a quote from Jesus. And I just want to make sure everyone knows I am definitely not Jesus. Uh, I did meet a guy once who thought he was Jesus. I'm pretty, I'm 99.9% sure it was not Jesus. But I, you know, I am a dad. I am a dad and I love being a dad, especially on Easter because I don't know, being a dad just, just adds so, so much more joy into Easter. So, because uh, you get to do things like, you know, feed your children chocolate all day long, right? This is a, this is a photo of my daughter when she was two and a half. And I, I think this is the very first chocolate Easter egg she ever ate. And I got it on camera. And what I think is very curious about this is if you take the size and weight of that little chocolate Easter egg and, and you look at the ratio between the size and weight of that Easter egg to her, and then you apply that ratio to me, that Easter egg would be like the size of a football, right? And, and, and we let our kids eat dozens of these on Easter Sunday, right? That's just what we do, right? That's how we celebrate Easter. Hey, kids, happy Easter. Jesus is alive. Now go eat your body weight in chocolate, right? But that's how we do it, right? That's how we celebrate Easter. This morning, I want to celebrate Easter by looking at this quote from Jesus. I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus said this in the context of another story about a dead guy who didn't stay dead. His name was Lazarus. And we find his story in the Gospel of John, chapter 11. So if you brought your personal Bible from home today, I'd like to invite you to open it up to the Gospel of John, chapter 11. If you have a smartphone with a Bible app, punch up John, chapter 11. If you're at home, watch on the live stream. Awesome. Happy Easter. And we are so glad that you have joined us. You are part of our fellowship this morning here at St. John. But you got no excuse. Grab your personal Bible, open it up to John chapter 11. I'm going to start at verse 1, but just so you know, I'm going to skip around a little bit. This is one of the reasons why it's great to have it open in front of you, because you can kind of follow along and you can see the verses I skip. Maybe you want to put a bookmark in there, like your essentials card or a donut or something like that, and you can take it home and read the whole story this afternoon. You'll get even more out of it. But I'm, gonna, I'm just going to hit the highlights. I'm going to start with John chapter 11, verse 1. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. And we're going to find out that he wasn't just sick. He was so sick that he's going to die. In verse 3, uh, we find out that he has, um, he, has, he has two sisters, Mary and Martha. And the sisters sent word to Jesus. In verse 3, they said, Lord, the one you love is sick. This was bad news in the middle of an otherwise good life. And I think at this point, we just have to pause and acknowledge the fact that although there's a lot of people here this morning who are in a really great season of your life, right? You're happy. You came to church this morning because you want to praise God and you want to uh, thank God for being so good to you and thank him for his blessings and just celebrate Easter with your family and, 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 and you're just in a really good place in your life. And if that's you, that's awesome, I praise God for that. That's just, that's just, just amazing. But we also have to acknowledge that, there, that there's a lot of people for whom that's not the case. People who, uh, maybe, maybe that's you. Maybe you're in not such a great season of your life. Maybe you have heard the same kind of bad news that Jesus heard in the scripture. The one you love is sick. Or maybe it's that job you love is going away. Or that dear friendship you have is over. Or maybe it's that, that your dream marriage has turned into a nightmare. 
or maybe you personally have been deeply affected by the events at Klein Kane High School last week, and that, is, uh, that has impacted you or someone that you love and care for. And this bad news has, has affected you. Or maybe it's a health concern that, 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 that is of yours. Or maybe you're struggling with depression or anxiety or, or whatever it is. I just want you to know two things. Whatever it is you're struggling with this morning, I want you to know two things. Number one, Jesus cares. He knows exactly how you feel because he's been there. We just read it. He has received bad news also. He has been in the place where you are. And he cares. And the second thing I want you to understand is that we here at St. John care. I care very much. Even if I've never even met you, I care about you. And there's a lot of people here who care about you. We have this prayer team who, who really cares. And we have a, a Stephen ministry team that really cares. And we have elders and, and greeters who really care. And so after the service, I want you to feel free to come up to me. And I would love to pray with you. I'd love to listen to you. Or you can go up to anyone with a red tag. That's our elders and our greeters. They would love to pray with you and talk to you. And, and we, our prayer team has the same kind of thing hanging around there, except it's blue and it says prayer on it. Go up to any of them. They would love to pray with you. They usually gather right up here after the service. Or if you want to, just talk to the person next to you in the pew. They care. We're here for you. But I want you to see now how Jesus reacts to receiving bad news. He says, this sickness will not end in death. And then he says something amazing. And these are, I want you to hang on these words. He says, it's for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. These are the most important words of this entire story. And these, are the, these words govern this whole story and they're going to govern everything that we're going to talk about in the next few minutes today that I want you to understand, especially if you're going through a difficult time in your life, I want these words to just, just resonate around in, in your brain and your soul. It's for God's glory that you're going through this. And God intends for his son to be glorified through it. And, and, and I want you to take this as a sign. If you came this morning because you needed a word from God uh, to get you through this week or get you through whatever it is that you're going through, I want you to take it as a sign this morning that you came and you heard these words that God intends for his son Jesus Christ to be glorified through whatever it is that you're going through. Take that as a sign. Skipping ahead to verse 17. Jesus arrives in Bethany, the village where Lazarus and Martha and Mary live. It says, on his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Meaning that Lazarus wasn't mostly dead, Princess Bride fans. He was all the way dead. He was dead dead. He was dead and then some. All right? Verse 18. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem. And many Jews, they, this story takes place in Israel, so everyone there is Jewish. So it's just a lot of people. Many people had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus, you took too long. Jesus, where were you when we needed you, Jesus? What's the problem? Why didn't you answer my prayer, Jesus? And I think that every single one of us can relate to that. Every single one of us. We have all had times in our lives where we've prayed for something. When we were in dire straits, there's maybe someone that, that we love and we have we, 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 there's something heavy hanging on our hearts and we go to God in prayer earnestly. And, and we're praying, and you pray, and you pray, and you pray, and you pray, and it seems like God is completely silent. In fact, sometimes it seems like things are just getting worse instead of better. And you, you, you start feeling like, well, is, is, is God listening? Jesus, why are you taking so long? Where are you, Jesus? If you had just answered my prayer a month ago when I started praying, we wouldn't be in this situation today. It wouldn't be this bad. 
What's taking you so long, God? And if you've ever felt like that, and I know you have, and the next time you feel like that, because I know you will, because you're human, I want you to know that that's okay. It's okay to feel like that. And I want you to understand that Martha in this story felt like that. And this part of the story is in the Bible because God wants you to know it's okay to feel like that. And it's okay to come to him and say, what's taken you so long? Because when you do that, he's got you right where he wants you, which is with him. Right? I, I can't tell you what God's plan is. Right? I can't tell you the how. But I can tell you the what. And the what is that God intends for his son Jesus to be glorified through your situation. And that's good news because it means that he's in the middle of the situation. It means that what's bad news to you is bad news to him. But he is ultimately, he is in control of it. He has a plan and he intends to be glorified through it. That's a good thing. Now I'm in verse 22. Verse 22, Martha says to Jesus, but I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And before we look at the next verse, what we're gonna find in the next verse is that Martha is thinking too small. She's praying too small. Have you ever prayed too small? I bet you have because I have, right? We, we tend to, to, you know, not pray big enough. Like, I don't know what, it, what, what we're thinking, right? Are we thinking that, well, you know, I, 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 I don't want to ask God for, like, the ideal for absolutely everything to go perfectly in this situation, for it to be completely resolved and immediately. I don't know. Maybe that's too big to ask. Maybe I'll just ask for one little thing, and maybe if God could just give me this little thing, then that would really help to deal with the big thing. And why are we thinking that? Why are we praying that small? What, is God not all-powerful? Is God, does he not love us with his whole heart? Does he not care intimately about all of us? No, right? So pray big, folks, pray big. Pray big. But you can see how Martha's kind of praying small. She says, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. She's thinking that she, she's saying, you know, I know that, that, that Lazarus is going to go to heaven. He's going to have eternal life. I get that. But Jesus says, no, 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 Martha, you're praying too small. He says, look, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Martha, Martha, do you believe this? I want you to notice that he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He does not say, I have the ability to resurrect. No, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. What we have to understand is that the, the resurrection is not an event. It's a person. We are not gathered here this morning on Easter Sunday just to remember a historical event that happened 2,000 years ago, ancient history. No, we are gathered here in God's house to celebrate and worship a person, Jesus Christ, the resurrection. We are here to worship the resurrection. Because the resurrection is not an event, it's a person. It's not just what he does, it's who he is. And it means that, that when you, that the resurrection is not something that's going to happen to you when you die. As a baptized believer in Jesus, the resurrection is something that happens to you in this life all the time. It means that God is going to have his son be glorified in your situation. That's his plan. But still, if you're like me, sometimes it's difficult to see him working in your life. It's difficult to see what he's up to. But I've found in my life that, that, if, that, that when, when that happens, it's probably because I'm more centered on myself 
and not enough centered on him. And so if you want to see him working in your life, you have to be less centered on yourself and more centered on him. Ooh, that's good. Let me say that again. If you really want to see God at work in your life, you have to be less centered on yourself and more centered on him. Let's go back to verse 26. Jesus says, And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Great confession of faith. And then I'm going to skip ahead to verse 43. Verse 43, they are now outside the tomb where Lazarus has been buried for four days. And Jesus is standing there and he says, the resurrection, Jesus calls out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. You see, dead things don't stay dead when the resurrection walks into the room. Dead relationships between mother and a daughter or between two friends or two church members or a a wife and a husband, dead relationships don't stay dead when the resurrection walks into that relationship. People deadened by doubts and hopelessness don't stay dead. People who are leading dead lives in addiction don't stay dead. Dead lives trapped in homelessness and poverty don't stay dead. People with a dead faith don't stay dead in their faith when the resurrection walks into their life. That same loud voice is calling out to you right now. Come out. Come out. Your sins can be forgiven. Not because you are good, but because he is good. And you can make it through whatever it is you're facing. You can be set free from addiction You can make it through, not because you are strong, but because he is strong. And you can experience the presence and the joy and the love of God the Father, not because you deserve it, but because he is just that good. He's here. Folks, he's here in this room. He has walked into your life. He is resurrected and he is calling out to you right now. If you believe it, then join me. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen.